Galloway's Support Through Sight Loss. Hello and welcome to the uh, Get Active Catch-Up. Today we've got Steve Fox joining us from Australia. Now, Steve is a blind surfer, paddleboarder and short filmmaker. Steve's recent video that he made on YouTube um, raised some interesting questions about visually impaired people getting employment in the, the wake of the, the COVID lockdown. So here's Steve to tell us a little bit about himself. So over to Steve. When I was diagnosed, I was already pretty much legally blind from a peripheral vision point of view, but my central vision was quite good. And I didn't really deal with it for a, a very long time. I think that's a story common with a lot of people with retinitis pigmentosa. When you do have that good central vision and you can kind of fake it over a long period of time, that's, that's what I did. Um, and I, I, I did that too long, like a lot of people with retinitis pigmentosa as well. But yeah, going back to my school, I, I went through normal school. Um, I did reasonably well at school. I started a career in radio when I was 20. And I worked in radio for over 25 years. Um, I was a radio announcer and program director. And I traveled all over Australia. That whole time as well, I was right into surfing. Surfing was a has always been a huge part of my life from the time that I was 12 or 13 um, or 13, 14, getting my first surfboard. And when I got into my late 40s with my retinitis pigmentosa, I, I got to a, a kind of a, a crisis point where my peripheral vision had narrowed right down to four or five degrees. My central vision was really starting to deteriorate. And that's when I reached out to get support, uh, something that I hadn't done as far as mobility went in the past. I had used electronic magnifiers and things for work and Zoom text, stuff like that. But all through my journey, I put everything off until way too late. And I suppose, um, one of the things that I've been trying to do now is to maybe help a few people not make the same mistakes that I made. So was, was that through like acceptance, if you will, trying to come to terms with it yourself and accept it yourself? Yeah. 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 I, looking back, I don't know why I, I made such a, you know, a deal of it, but I think a lot of it came back to the way I was brought up by my father. Uh, he was a real disciplinarian. Uh, when I was diagnosed, when I was 12, he talked to me about it at length that first day when I was diagnosed, but he never ever mentioned it again. And it wasn't spoken about. And it was just, well, he's coping okay with his sight loss so far. And if it gets worse, we'll deal with it then. But in the meantime, just keep doing what you're doing. So I was kind of just left and... I don't know whether I was made to feel ashamed of it or something, but I just pushed it aside. So through my working life, I told people when I had to, but like I said in the video before um, that you've watched, James, I never ever put on a resume that I was legally blind or vision impaired. If I went to a job interview and I had to talk to them about it, if I need to talk about um, having to use a screen reader or do something differently, I'd do it there face to face and I'd only tell people what they needed to know. I wouldn't go into a diagnosis. I just said, oh, look, I've got bad eyes and I need to do this. But it's okay. That's how I work around it. And that's the way I went through my working life, right up to the point where I was really severely vision impaired, uh, blind. Um, and I think having got to start early on and being able to establish a reputation in the industry that, that got me through until I retired. And having a background in the media, I suppose that's why I started making these YouTube videos. I'm not extremely intelligent at it. I'm a little bit sporadic in, in the videos that I make, but um, had great fun doing it, had a great response. 
I've made videos on me surfing. So when I lost my sight, one thing that I really didn't want to give up was my surfing. So I just had to figure out a different way that I could go surfing and I tried different ways and I lined up some friends and eventually worked out a way that it could happen. And if you want to that I may, you know, I hang on to the buddy that I go, go with his surfboard as he leads me down to the beach. He'll tell me when to paddle out and when I'm paddling out into the white wash, I'm going in the right direction. So I paddle out the back, we meet up again. My buddy will look for waves and say, I can see one come, start paddling now and working out that timing, that took a fair bit of practice. Yeah. But once we got it organized and I could paddle into a wave, then the muscle memory and 40 years of surfing in sight, I've just been able to continue doing it with next to no vision and I still surf all the time. I love it. It's great. Must be a cracking feeling that when you, when you caught your first wave when you were legally blind, if you will, to catch that first wave, knowing that yeah. you, you've, got, you've done it all on your own with a bit of help from, from some mates. Sort of thing. Like, you know, for other people with retinitis pigmentosa, to know what it's like losing your eyesight over a long period of time, you make little adjustments along the way. But I, I got to a crisis point where I just couldn't do it on my own. And that's when I had to start figuring out a way to do it with somebody else. And actually, I was down at the club last night for dinner and trivia night. You'll be pleased to know we won the trivia. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was talking to the, one of the mates that takes me. He said, you know, you've only run over two people since we've been surfing while you've been blind. So you're doing pretty well. That's we've good. only had a couple of accidents. So everybody else in the lineup is totally okay yeah, with any, I, any hassles. Or... I, wear a, I wear a shirt that says vision impaired yeah. and people around me are told and the ones that I've run over, they've only been people that I've known and they've said it was their fault for getting in the way. So <laughs> that's, that's the way it goes. But yeah, I've just tried to continue doing the things that I've loved. Um, I go stand up paddle boarding as well. Yeah, And for those that can see behind me, my guide dog's sitting back there. He jumps on the stand-up paddleboard with me and we, we go stand-up paddleboarding together. Um, it's, it's different. It's a different way to do it. But, you know, just learning different ways to do things without sight, it's been amazing for me. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's like a lot of the the activities that we do as well. It kind of fits in because we we take people who come to Galloway's for the the first time since they've lost the, the sight, they've lost the sight. They don't know where to turn to, so they've come to us for help and advice. And we've had people come to us, and they've been you probably know yourself, Steve, absolute rock bottom. And it's like everything they know has fallen out of the world and everything, and they've come back. We've talked about the get active. We've tried a few things, canoeing, kayaking, uh, some of the walks and things that we do. And just to see people's confidence build up on that, it's absolutely amazing. You see people come from rock bottom to achieving things that six months ago they'd have thought impossible. So it's, it's absolutely amazing showing what people can do, giving the right help and support and encouragement. It's something else I shared in one of my videos as well about when I first uh, reached out for help with mobility training, learning to use a cane, and I was really resistant to do it. I was, I'd been hanging on to my wife for grim death for a long period of time. I wouldn't go anywhere on my own, except with her or a mate or something. You know, I just became really isolated. And then I, I reached out to get some help and the guy said to me, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, this is something I need to do, but I was really reluctant. He said, where do you want to do it? And I said, well, as far away from where I live as possible. So we drove to a, a town not far from here and we went down a back street and I was really, was just, I just didn't want to do it. I just, I don't know why, but I started to use the cane and while I was doing it, there was a workman on a house across the road and just down a little bit. 
and he yelled out, you're a braver man than me, you know, good on you, mate. And it just opened my eyes because for so long, I've been trying to hide my vision loss, my sight loss. And then as soon as I got the cane out and realised that other people weren't going to look at me in, in a bad way, they actually supported me. And, you know, to feel that support straight away. And I've felt that, you know, ever since then with, and maybe it's lucky on where I live, but, you know, with the cane or with my guide dog, people are happy to help once they, they know that you're vision impaired. But trying to muddle through yeah. with sight loss, bumping into people, people, you know, what's this bloke doing? You know, watch where you're going. Um, but once they understand, it's so much easier. It's so much easier. It is. I think a lot of the, the times when you, you first get your white cane or your, your magnifier or whatever it is, it's, it's sort of, or it was for me anyways, like, I don't, want to, I don't want to use this. It's drawing attention to myself and things like that. But then after using it, um, like your white cane or your guide dog, it can diffuse situations quite a lot. You know, if you bump into somebody and you've not got your white cane, it's like, um, it's just yeah. like anybody else bumping into anyone else. But if, as soon as they see you've got a white cane or something, it's like, you know what, mate? Sorry, it's not your fault. It's my fault. I should have seen your white cane and everything. So it just diffuses any situations. And I think it's like, wearing, it's like wearing the rash vest that says vision impaired surfer on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get away with everything, anything you want. Basically. Um, a bit of a free but, pass. But from what, what you just said then about the, the builder, the construction worker, uh, mm -hmm. sort of shouting encouragement to you, I think we've all had that, that one moment that we can go back to. Um, and it's like something clicks inside your head and you know, you think, you know what, I can do this. I know for me and some of the guys have heard this before, they've probably all got the same sort of similar sort of tales. Mm. I was on a, an outdoor residential with Galloway's and I was struggling to come to terms with things and we were on a climbing wall and I remember seeing a guy who'd been born totally blind, never seen anything at all. And I watched him go up the climbing wall and something inside me just clicked thinking, you know what, if he can do it and he can't see anything. I'm going to give it a, a damn good go myself. And from that moment, something just, just clicked inside and thought, you know what, there are things we can still do. And, and from there, I just went from strength to strength and ended up where I am now sort of thing. So um, if we want, what we can do, Steve, we can unmute everybody and we can have like a, a general Q&A session, something like that, if, if that's okay. Oh, that's great, yeah. No worries, just see if I can unmute everyone. All right, that should be everyone unmuted. Can everybody hear us now? Yeah. 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 So has, has anybody got any questions for Steve based on what he's already mentioned to us? I can just echo the fact that it's not so much a question, but I can just echo the same situation about roadworks when you're out and about. Sometimes workmen can be your best of friends. You know, uh, the normal fear is, oh, there's roadworks down here. But no, they can be very helpful. And I'll agree, yes. Oh, be careful, they help you round it. Or something like that, or even cross the road for that matter. As was the last case, because the last one was on a corner. That happened to me today, actually. I was walking my general walk up to town where I live to get a coffee with right. my guide dog and they were changing a power pole. And the guy said, oh, you can't go down there. He said, oh, hang on a minute. He blocked the road both directions and oh. walked with York Knight down the middle of the road. <laughs> around this oh. power pole. Clever. And then guided us back onto the footpath and we're on our way. So all of those oh, times I'm worried mind. about, you know, being, you know, an inconvenience or anything, people are so happy to help is my experience, mm. once they understand, you know, what you're going through. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm a rehabilitation officer, but I'm also visually impaired, and I use a cane in certain situations, in busy areas, when it's very dark, or when it's um, somewhere I don't know. And I did actually travel to Australia in 2003 on my own, and I have to say that my experiences 
were very, very positive in Australia. Um, you know, I, I had no um, worries or um, people were very good, people were very helpful. Can I just say, this is such an important message for anybody who's thinking of getting a cane, why hide? And I'm sat here, there's tears rolling down my face and it's just music to my ears, why hide? I made a video. I made a video. So at first, they use a cane. I think the problem is that they feel self-conscious. They feel, in some cases, people feel like they're a fraud because they can actually have some residual vision. And it's very difficult because in certain situations, they might not need the cane as much as in other situations. And that exacerbates the feeling of feeling like they're, they're, they're faking it. Um, of course, we also are living in a political climate at the moment, which isn't particularly warm and friendly towards disabled people. But um, as a rehabilitation officer, one of the things that I usually say to people um, is, first of all, a long cane is, you, you think of it as a tool, because it's something to enable you to do things that you want to be able to do that you never could. It's um, it's something that you you know you can kind of rely on, and it gives you the independence. People think of it as taking independence away, but it's actually giving you the independence, and it's taking away the pressure of travelling through a busy street because you're then having to use your residual vision just to look ahead and to keep yourself orientated, whereas without a cane, you're having to use your vision to scan the pavement, to avoid people, to keep track of where you're going, you know, and there's an awful lot of pressure in that and it gets, it becomes very tiring. Yeah, I made a video and I called it coming to terms with being legally blind. And oh. I talked about all of what I talked about a minute ago in the video about come, getting my head around using the cane I just say in the video to people, if you're thinking about it, get the training, try it. And yeah. you don't have to use it all the time. Exactly. You know, when I first started to use the cane, yeah. I used it at the airport and, you know, in difficult, crowded situations. Mm -hmm. But it was very quickly that I wouldn't go anywhere without it, you know. Yeah. And you'll find at airports, if you book travel assist, you get through security one well, hell of a lot quicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can clear an airport. I, I've had positive experience of that. I cleared an airport quicker than fully sighted people when I've landed mm. sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask another question? One, Denise. Does your guide dog really, really love being on the back of your, back of your, your board with you when you're in the sea? <laughs> I, I don't take him in the ocean where it's rough. I only take him in the lagoon where it's nice and calm. And he just doesn't want to be left at home. He, oh, wow. He, whatever I'm doing, that's what he wants to do. So he loves to run around on the beach. We do that a fair bit. And he'll just sit on the board and he doesn't move. He just sits there and looks around. So you can see that in a couple of my videos as well. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. So he does love the water. He doesn't, he's not a big swimmer, but he loves to run through the water and splash and <laughs> all that sort of stuff. That's a lab for you though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Does he hoover a lot as well? Food? <laughs> if I if I let him, he would eat 24 hours a day. Yes, Labradors <laughs> do. Set and with food. He's really please good. Tell me you don't feed him tidbits off your plate. Please tell no, me you no. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> do I can tell? <laughs> so Steve, what the public is not supposed to feed them. The public no, he does. You can see it in his face. He's smiling. <laughs> I go to cafes and things a lot, so yeah. it's really important not to give him any of my food. So that when we go to the cafe, he just sits on the floor and goes to sleep, and he's happy to do that. So. He's pretty good that way. Yeah. You, need to, you need to hoover when you've got a guide dog sometimes, though, because they eat everything off the floor, don't they? <laughs> but the, yeah. Another good video I think you did, Steve, was one around the, the shopping the shopping mall, was it? With lockdown, was yes. it one of your first trips out with... Uh, I've made a couple of videos with, 
with York and I wear a, a GoPro just mounted on my chest and you can just see York as we walk around. And I think it's a good insight for people that, you know, have sight or maybe thinking about getting a guide dog. I've had a lot of great feedback from, um, from people just to get an insight of what it's like working with a guide dog. I don't think people understand how much concentration goes into it, how much you've got to work as a team together to, to navigate and do all yeah, those sorts I, of things. I so. think the, gen, the general public sort of see it as though you've got a guide dog, you're totally blind, the dog does everything for you. I think there's that misconception out there with the general public and the dog knows where it's going, but he doesn't. I think you've still got to tell him. a dog a map, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I kid you not. Yeah, he, he can't read the entry and exit signs yet, but, you know, we're oh. working on that. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy, find the cafe in the bar and that's all you need. <laughs> I, I, I suppose you found it a lot easier, haven't you, with lockdown, with having a dog, in that the public will give you a wider berth anyway for the two metres required for lockdown, for, for the social distancing. Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, guide dogs don't understand social distancing, so... No, they don't. He, you see, they, they don't. So, you know, I suppose, in a way, you're in a better position because even with my red and white cane, because I'm deaf and blind, uh, I, um, I still find that some members of... Generally and large, people are, are, are very helpful and, and good, you know. Possibly more so than before we had to social distance. But there are still pockets of people who are still not adhering properly to social distancing and moving themselves in, you know, they should go in the road, not me. Our pavements are narrower than you, as you see. Right. You've probably got more room in Australia to spread out. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how is the lockdown now over there, Steve? Is it, is it lifted quite a bit or are you still got different sorts of uh, sanctions and things? Or Where we are in New South Wales, it's pretty free at the moment all the cafes and restaurants are open again but with social distancing we didn't really get it really bad in new south wales i mean we're still getting 20 cases a day diagnosed which is a bit of a spike for us um wow. but victoria have had a, a bad run just recently and they've been getting between 500 and that a day of the day they had 700 cases diagnosed which compared Ooh. to Places around the world, like the UK and the US, is minimal. But for us down here, it's it's probably as bad as it's been. We've just had a recent spike in the northwest. There was the west of Yorkshire and Greater Manchester area have had a, a recent spike and a, and a bit of a, a semi lockdown where certain rules have been reapplied. So it, it's going to be like that for a long time everywhere, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to be up and down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. again, I made a video a while ago with, that, with us in lockdown and walking through town and it was, it was like a ghost town. There, yeah. there was nobody around anywhere, but now things are pretty much back to normal. Uh, can I ask another question? Because I'm, I'm, really, I'm intrigued. Is there a difference between surfing in winter in Australia and surfing in summer in Australia? Are the seas rougher or...? The seas... You, you probably do get more big swell in bigger swells in winter. We've had a couple of big swells recently. I, I only go out when it's three foot or less these days. You know, I say getting hit in the head by a wave you don't see when it's three foot, it's not that bad, but oh my it's word. Ten foot swell, <laughs> that's another story. So it's a bit harder for me to find times to get out in winter when the waves are big. We've had a couple of big storms recently where we had 30 to 40 foot swells off the coast. So that's Ooh. pretty major. And then further up the coast from here, a place called Wombrel, that, that actually eroded the beach and a few houses fell into the sea, which isn't good. But oh. yeah, we, you can get big swell in summer as well. I just <laughs> pick days where it's more manageable for someone that can't see the waves. Yeah, so what, what sort of board do you ride, Steve? I've got a garage full of boards just over there, and I've got oh. boards from mm -hmm. seven foot four to ten foot six. But, 
but I am older. <laughs> I, rode, I rode very short boards when I was younger, but yeah, I, I, a bit when, easier to ride. A bit easier when I was able to, you know, before my site went, I, I did a, a little bit of surfing, didn't do a great lot. And where we are, there's few places to go that actually catch any waves. So for, for where I used to go, it was probably about a two, two and a half hour drive away just to, to get somewhere. And if you were surfing a two foot wave, it was like the best thing ever because <laughs> of the, the waves weren't, weren't that great. So the board Thank you to Cornwall that will be your... Uh, yeah, it would be, yeah. But we used to go to like North Wales and Anglesey oh, just right. for the day and things. Um, so the board I used to ride, I've, I've actually still got it. It's mum and dad's garage yeah. at the moment. It's a, an eight foot mini mouth. So, yeah. so that I could catch more of the smaller waves, if you will. And it, it was a nice fun board, so... Sounds like a good choice to me. Yeah, I just I've not used it since my site have gone since my site went, and it's like yeah, I want to go and try it. Can I try it? Can I not try it? But obviously, speaking to you, the big the biggest issue I've got now is is getting there. So, but mm. uh, that's something I need to work on and just give it a go, try it out. Bring your um, surfing mates and get them going. That's it. <laughs> you need to book book. To try and book that um, surf centre at Snowden, James. We do, yeah. Once, once, that's one thing I do want to do. Um, Steve, what we've got near us is a place called, well, I'm not saying near us, it's probably about two and a half, three hour drive. It's a place called Surf Snowdonia, which is a, an inland um, surf pool that they've had built. It was an old quarry and obviously they filled it in and they've got like a, a plough and it pro provides sort of the perfect wave day in day out sort of thing so uh, we need there's to try and go, go there and give that a go there's a couple of those in australia now too that i haven't tried yet but it's on the list yeah. but i live about 300 meters from the water so wow. we're pretty lucky. Um, if, if i was not... steve just pick your brains if i was taking a group of visually impaired people that have never tried surfing before would you advice to try surfing first or maybe bodyboarding boogie boarding just to get them used to being in the water and on the waves i would probably start with a bodyboard because it's soft and just get them used to being in the water yeah either that or take them out on like the mini mal in very small waves yeah and just put them in and let them lie down on the board because as you know, it's easier to ride a, a mini mal than a, a bodyboard. Yeah. Just lying on the board. But then when you come off at the end, you know, unless you sort of have a few techniques, you're liable to get cleaned up by the board as well, which is yeah. a, <laughs> a bit hard and have pointy fins on them. But, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's something we can try. It's, so are there, are there any other activities that you've done yourself, apart from the surfing and the, the paddle boarding that you, you really Just enjoy? Surfboards. Um, you can get soft surfboards too, so that'll be something to try. Where I live in Australia, there's a surf school here, and we have backpackers from all over the world come here all the time to, to learn how to surf, and they ride soft boards. So. Yeah. Um, but I definitely... Definitely recommend surfing um, as something to try, as long as you can find a beach that's got a gentle wave. Stand-up paddleboarding, I think, could be a really good one if people have a minimal amount of vision. Um, I think if you're, if you're totally blind, the balance might be a little bit tough. But if you have enough vision to be able to see even a horizon or just enough to, to keep your balance, Stand-up paddleboarding, I think, is a great one because it's it's enjoyable. It's 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 not it's not as hard as surfing, and it's just a great experience. Yeah, well, we've we've got oh. one we've got one girl who's in our group, and unfortunately she couldn't make it today. Uh, but she's visually impaired, but recently she's ended up in a wheelchair as well. And one thing that she really loves is her sailing, and um, especially windsurfing. Because what she does is she'll she'll kneel or sit on the the windsurfer, and she's got the she's got the sail set right for her, and she's off. I mean, she's sailed the full length of. I don't know if you're familiar with any of the the lakes up in up near us. But there's one called Lake Coniston, which was where Campbell set the uh, the water speed record in the Bluebird. Right. Um, 
So and she sails sort of the whole length of that and back solo. All right, there's been sighted people nearby her, but solo on a, a windsurfer, and that was fantastic to see, a fantastic achievement. Mm-hmm. And again, that just shows that given the right right help, support, um, knowledge, encouragement, and everything like that, you know, world's there's limit, a, really. There's a guy in Australia that I talked to who's another blind surfer who lives in Sydney. And he does the Sydney and Hobart yacht race every year. So he sails from Sydney to Hobart, which is, I suppose, a couple of thousand kilometres. Uh, he does that every year. Yeah. Um, I also go blind target shooting. So uh, Acoustic air rifle. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do that as well. And uh, we, we started a group up probably 10 years ago now. Uh, I was one of them. I don't, it's, yeah, it's about 10 years ago now, David. I think it's 10. And I was, uh, we set it up in the November and we went into the Nationals in February, March time. And we'd only been shooting once a week for about an hour up until that time. And at the first Nationals competition, we came away, I came away as the um, National Class C champion. I was, the first, I was the first one in our group to score the perfect hundred on the thanks to the acoustic the acoustic shooting was something I really loved doing. So Yeah, so I've started doing that and I actually met someone from the UK. They had the world championships out here last year. And I think it was Michael Waples. Mike Waples, so, yeah. Yeah. So I met him and had a talk to him and he was great, gave me some tips. But um I've only just started doing it, but it's something I've enjoyed doing as well. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I found it relaxing for some reason. I don't know. I think it's because you're concentrating on your breathing and, and things like that. It was a bit like, I guess, meditation to a certain degree because you're trying to calm down and blank everything out and just focus on the sound. I think the message that I want to get to people is losing my sight. I, it took me a long time to realise it, but you can keep doing the things that you love doing. You just need to find a different way to do it. it and I, I don't expect everybody to go and start surfing. I've been surfing for 40 years, so it, it comes naturally to me. But it's just a, an example of you don't have to give up things that you've been doing. You just need to sit down and really think about how you can change or, you know, get some assistance to keep doing what you do in some form. I think Sorry, it's really important to, you know, I say salt water is good for the soul. It, riding the waves is great, but just getting out there with your mates, being in the water and the sun, you know, that's, that's the best medicine. Definitely, yeah. Hi, Steve. Um, I just wondered um, about the surfing. If you, um, well, so I know that there's a place in Cornwall in the UK um, that are doing some surf schooling and things, but um, I, I just wonder like how to get into it really in terms of when you first start. If you if you do manage to stand up, um, so I've done a bit of stand up paddleboarding once in, and um, it was okay. I can't see, but uh, so the direction was really difficult. So you couldn't tell when when the wind was blowing mm. you around. But um, yeah. but yeah, surfing wise, like. How would you know when a wave, when to go on a wave? So I'm kind of, I guess like we all know like how to swim, like swim in or lie on in the sea, and the wave takes you up and down. But staying with a wave is like a weird concept because you you don't really see what they like. So I I go with a couple of mates who we've worked out a system together, and I get them to say, all right, the one after this one is the one that you're going to go on. So I'm sitting on my surfboard out the back and I feel the wave go underneath me. I say, okay, well, I'm going on the one after this. So I start to paddle slowly. And then when I start to feel the wave, I paddle as hard as I can. And then you feel the energy of the wave pick you up. That's when, you know, you wouldn't be able to stand up straight away if you're just beginning. But once you feel that energy, I stand up. And prior to that, I say to the person, am I going to go left or right? So in surfing terms, I surf with my left foot forward. If I'm going right, 
I'm facing the wave. And if I'm going left, I'm, I have my back to the wave. So I know which direction I'm going to go in. And then I just feel the energy of the wave through my feet and the board. Something that all surfers do, it's just when you lose your sight, you're reliant a lot more. So when, when the board starts to slow down, you know that you've gone down really low on the wave and you angle or turn the board to go further up on the wave. So you sort of, you're judging where you are on the wave by the speed of the board. And it doesn't always work perfectly. I get wiped out, but it seems to work pretty well. It's all part of the form. But I think if you're starting out, just getting someone to push you into the whitewash and feeling the wave taking you on a board you're above the water. It's a totally different feeling to, to body surfing. And then if you try to get on your knees and then try to get on your feet, I think if you manage to do it, there is one warning, you'll get hooked. <laughs> what's, what's the saying to say? Is it something like only a surfer knows the feeling or something like that? Yeah, That's one of the... <laughs> so I got hooked when I was about 13 or 14 and I've spent the last 40 years just doing that when I could see I'd surf before work and after work and every holiday was a surfing holiday and these days I've got to be a bit more picky when I go out but you're still chasing that feeling of just going down the beach and catching a few waves. Yes I mean I, I don't think it will matter now with the way our sights are was whether it was a, a three foot beach break or Ten foot pipe in Hawaii or somewhere like that. <laughs> just catching the waves, catching the wave in this. You're still gonna have the same buzz on it, I think. But no, oh, I still get stoked. It's you know, it's just a great. The only thing is, York doesn't like it when I go surfing because he doesn't get to come with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steve. James, James, I think Jenny's asked a question. Jenny. I'll read. I can. I can make it out oh, to read I, it. I, I, I typed it in for Jenny because uh, she she couldn't stage games. So I typed. I have noticed. Go on, Andrew. If you can do that. You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, being lazy, I was just putting it in the chat box. Um, uh, yeah, Jenny. <coughs> Jenny. Jenny was asking, um, uh, what are the what are the challenges of finding in, what are the challenges have you found kind of with finding um, finding employment and. Um, what would you inform an employer if you were looking for work now? If you were looking for work now, I was looking for work now. Like I said in my video, I wouldn't put in my resume that I was vision impaired. I think I I worked in radio for a long period of time and I applied for a lot of jobs. And at the end of my career, last fifteen years, I was a, a program director or program manager, and I employed a lot of people and nobody puts in their resume anything that may be a difficulty that they have. Nobody else does it. So my philosophy is nobody else does it. Why should I do it? So the only time I would talk to an employer about something about my sight loss would be if I got a call back for an interview, I'm perfectly happy to be open and honest, but I think, Far too often, employers would just look at a, a diagnosis in a resume and just move on to the next resume. You know, it's, it's that hidden discrimination. People that are blind and vision impaired around the world, 50 to 80% unemployment, depending on where you are, is just way too high and it's ridiculous. And I think employers don't understand that there is assistive technology that people with sight loss are determined and resilient and hardworking. But if you put something like that in your resume, I think too often that resume is going to end up in the too hard basket. So I would tell an employer in the meeting, uh, in a job interview about my sight loss, but only about what they needed to know and what assistive technology or how I was going to overcome things that they might see as a problem. And I do it in a way that is, you've got to build stories for people and paint a picture for people. 
when you're an employer looking to employ somebody, it's all about finding someone who fits the culture of your organization, someone that's going to work well with all of your staff, not only be able to do the, the tasks and the workload, but also someone that's going to work well with everybody else. So you've got to be able to get that person to imagine you in that role. So if you have some experience that you can share with them in a way that you tell a story so that they can imagine it, just using the buzzwords like assistive technology and I can do that, that piece, you know, that task or whatever it might be, it's not enough. You need to be able to describe it in a way, paint a picture for them that they can imagine you in that role. So do you have, in, in Australia, do they have a, a system to help employees provide the assistive tech? Because over here we have a scheme called Access to Work, uh, which is a government run scheme. So that if anybody with a disability, um, there's a pot of money there that will help provide, whether it was the software, like you said, you used, was it Zoom text you use? Yeah, I use Supernova text. or bigger screen TVs and things like that yeah. to monitors. Um, so we've got a, a scheme over here where employers can tap into to provide that extra kit that the employee would need. So I just wonder if there's something similar in Australia. So we, have a, we have a system here called the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which has only been running for maybe four or five years. Ooh. It's been rolled out in stages around Australia. And that oh. has been amazing for people with a disability. There's there's basically two types of funding. There's what they call capacity building. So that would be training for tasks, uh, mobility training. Um, it would also pay for assistive technology if you needed it. Any of those sorts of things are well funded. And as long as you have a case, you guarantee that you'll get the funding for it. Then there's an, a separate line as well called uh, core funding and that's for all types of assistance in the home uh, support workers to go out with you in public to participate in community events or help you participate in sport go to the gym do all sorts of things so there's a lot of support in Australia now and it's been really beneficial to a lot of people you can have your funding managed through an agency or a I have mine self-managed, and if it's self-managed, it's very flexible. You can use the money as long as it's for the, you know, the right purpose. If you haven't spent money in one area, you can divert it to another area as long as it's all for the right similar purposes. It's, it's an amazing scheme. Very good. It it's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect. People have had some experiences that are difficult, so I don't want to say it's perfect, but. It is an amazing scheme. Yes, Dave, I just wanted to make, just go back to the point you were making before about finding employment. Um, I'm, I'm registered blind myself, uh, visually impaired. This is kind of a, something I was talking about this week with a couple of people over, over my LinkedIn page that I have online. Um, and I was kind of, for the role that I do for Galloway's as assistive technology coordinator, it's kind of asking myself the same question of, you know, do I, on my LinkedIn page, do I kind of declare that I'm visually impaired because I see that as a kind of a, an experience or a huge quality to, to the role that I perform. So I'm not saying, obviously, somebody that was fully sighted could certainly do my role, but I would also sometimes feel that you have a, a lived experience or a quality that again is something quite unique and and I also feel quite torn between and I agree with you and I agree with everything that you say I do feel at times quite torn because yet yeah, if you go in for a, a job where you know um, you don't want you like you're saying you don't want to declare that because it it could it could be seen negatively by the employer and I get that but I do still feel that people, you know, role models, people out there, you know, like yourself doing amazing things, you know, we shouldn't have to say, 
oh, we're visually, we're visually impaired and we do this. We shouldn't have to do that. And, I, and I'm kind of against that in a way because we're just doing the things that we love. It doesn't matter whether we're visually impaired or not. However, I do feel that this kind of not wanting to tell an employer about your visual impairment is because there's actually not enough awareness out there. And then I do feel that we need to see more role models, more people out there saying, I am visually impaired or I am, um, I am disabled and I can do this. And it's about time people stopped assuming that I couldn't. So I don't necessarily want to do that all the time, but I do feel that to, to, to make for the greater good, spreading more awareness do, will eventually change that. Ableism is a, something which I am totally against where people assume Andrew can't do that because he's visually impaired. But if there was more awareness, then I do feel that the world would be a better place. So I just wanted to put my spin on it. Yeah, I, and I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, there are definitely situations where, and certain roles where sight loss is a benefit and I would put it on a resume. And I, I don't, I don't want to hide my vision impairment and I, I never have hidden my vision impairment. But I see a resume as um, a job application letter is a tool to get someone to look at your resume. A resume is something that you do to, give, to get you an interview. And unless my sight loss was seen as being a positive for that role, I don't see why I should have to include it. To me, my sight loss is something that I'm not ashamed of. I, I'm not trying to hide it and I wouldn't hide it from an employer, but I don't, I wouldn't list my sight loss as an educational qualification or a work experience thing, unless it was relevant. So that's, that's just my spin on it. I would just like to declare, I suppose, and, and talk about my sight loss to a potential employer when I can do it face to face, rather than just have them assume, because let's face it, most people that um, are employers don't have experience with people with vision loss, and their perception of people that are blind or vision impaired comes from TV shows and movies, which isn't real, it's just not realistic. So for me to put it on a resume, um, when nobody else is listing anything on their resume other than their work history and education, um, I don't see why I should have to list it either. I'm not trying to hide it from an employer, happy to disclose it and talk about it, but I'd like to do it on my terms, not just list it on a piece of paper so someone can prejudge me before I go to an interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, pre I appreciate that. It's a fascinating conversation, I think. Um, and, there's lots of different ways. Of and I, I totally yeah. agree with you on the ableism thing. I suppose the videos that I make with it when I'm out and about with York and um, when I'm surfing and things like that, it's because I've met so many people that are blind and vision impaired who are dealing with it and struggling and at a stage where I was 10 years ago, I suppose, five, 10 years ago. And it, you know, I wish that I had someone to talk to, um, someone who I could learn from. You know, somebody can get a lifetime of experience and put it in one book and then pass it on. Things that took me 40 years to come to terms with and learn, if I can pass it on to somebody else in a five minute video, then that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's kind of exa exactly how I feel with that. Um, I've seen where I was when I first lost my sight and how much Galloway's had helped, had helped me along my sight loss journey. And now it's a case if I can pass some of that on to other people and help them out, then to me it's, it's job well done. It's, you know, the more people you can help and whatever and give them that encouragement that you need when you're first starting out. It's just a case of passing, passing on experiences. It's yeah, I didn't, I didn't have anyone to talk to when I was 12 and I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed by the ophthalmologists and they said, you know, at the time, 
you'll more than likely be blind by the time you're 21. Okay, thanks for coming. I'll see you next year. And that's it. And then my father, he said, I oh, talked about it that night, but then never spoke to me about it again. So I had nobody to talk to, wasn't referred to anybody. Oh. And I still find there are people today that have been dealing with retinitis pigmentosa. For oh. I get a lot of emails and things from people that have no experience with the blind or vision impaired community at all. And they've been dealing with it for 10 or 20 years. Well, another thing, going back to the, the resume, um, along similar lines, I had a, a survey came through the other day and I was filling it out. I think it was for archery or something. And they were saying, do you have a disability? And it listed a few disabilities like deafness, sight loss. And then later on in the survey, there was a question that says, do you consider yourself disabled? And I'm like, well, no, I don't. I'm like, yeah, I've got a disability, but I don't consider myself disabled. And it's like, Questions like that, because you could say to somebody who's living with whatever disability they've got completely, they go surfing, they go walking, they go climbing, they do whatever it is they want to do, and it doesn't really affect them. So when you ask them, do you consider yourself disabled? Probably me and some other people probably say, you know, I don't consider myself disabled. I might have a disability, but I'm not disabled. I'm still perfectly able to do whatever I want to do. That word, it, isn't it? That word is... It is, yeah. I hate that word, you know. I think the most thing about being, you know, about disability, it, it isn't so much the person that's disabled, it's the environment that disables the person and the situations that they find themselves in and systems. That's what the disabling factors really are. Absolutely. And, you know, you look at things like environmental changes, like, for example, in London, now someone might know the name of this, but there's a restaurant in London which is completely in the dark. Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah, you know, heard of that. more able people in that restaurant are the the blind, uh, the blind chef, you know, the the the, this, the team that work in there. They guide the sighted people around, so it reverses the role, and then suddenly, oh. yeah, they're the, they're, they're, those people become disabled, and we're well, not disabled, but it's for them to experience what it's like, and they're putting their their, their safety and their well-being in the hands of, of blind people and they do it very well I've never been but I'd love to go and um, but it's, it's things like that you know um, you're right social community you know the environment um and the way services are set up and systems yeah that's what they say it's the legislation we have as well you know I think it's the same in almost every situation where people are troubled around the world, education is the answer. That's yeah. what I believe. Yeah. Education is the answer in almost every social problem that you can think of. So, you know, education around people with a disability, you know, if you can educate the general public um, that it's not a, a disability, it's just a different way of doing things. Um, if the supports are there, we're just as capable as everybody else. You know, that, that's the answer, I think. Yeah, I think and another thing we have we, for, for holidays and things, we have some companies over here that specialise in holidays and hotels for, for visually impaired people and things like that. Yeah. Personally, I'm not a, a big fan of it. Um, for, for myself, I'd rather go on a regular package holiday with other people, you know, regular normal people whatever you want to say um and i'd rather go on them sort of holidays and and do my thing and be part of the group plus there's also a little bit there at the back, back of my mind thinking if the general public are seeing me going on holiday to a foreign place and then they see me going on like a snorkeling trip or a sailing trip that's that's there and they see me with a white cane and stuff and I've had people come up to me say, I didn't think you'd be able to do that with you being, you know, with you having a white cane and you being blind and things like that. Oh, yeah. And I just say to them, well, yeah, I am blind, but I do have a bit of useful vision. And the number of people I've come across have been sort of amazed at what, what you can do. Um, and I think just, just things like that is a way of trying to help educate the children. <laughs> I always say to people when I talk to people who have been diagnosed or are going through that sight loss journey 
in a sense you're you become an educator of, of the of the problem you know to other people your family your friends and what have you it hopefully a way of helping people overcome the embarrassment of it and i think part of the embarrassment and the um situation that they find themselves in, in the emotional turmoil i think part of that comes from the sociological perception that they've had as a sighted person previously when they've been unaware um when it's not really been on their horizon to know um, and so they are actually applying those perceptions to their own situation and you can often find that by breaking those down it actually breaks down that resistance to trying to do things trying to be more independent and and, and less sort of dependent on partners and things like that you know it, it's it is it's a journey it's an education and it's about highlighting those awarenesses to people that they know or even people that they don't know to try and make everywhere and for everybody particularly a, a, a better place to move around in really for me james one of the most important things that's come out of this conversation today is when you engage with the visually impaired community you learn so much from each other you almost find yourself again you know you don't you're not like i'm the blind person i can't do anything you are yourself again and you can't put a price on that and that's the importance of engaging with the blind community definitely and if, if well, it's if it's helpful not that you're not you you're just you with a sight problem but you're still you because you can get so, mutual support, can't you, from others in, in the blind society? Yeah, and that you. There's no other. There's no them. other better teachers than, than this community. No. Definitely not. Just uh, hope uh, it's been yeah. useful for everybody. So, um, I am mindful. I am mindful of the time, and especially for Steve. Uh, has well, anybody yeah, got yeah. any more questions? Do you have disability legislation in Australia? Over here in England, we've got what we call the Disability Discrimination Act. It's the which Equality covers Act. Public services and employment here in England and other things. Yeah, we have all that um, anti discrimination, all of those things. I mean, it's, it's against the law to discriminate. What you find is you can have all the legislation in the world. But the real problem is in the enforcement of that legislation. But I've got, I've got to say, I, I was very lucky in my career. I had some great employers. I worked in radio, and there are a few people that are blind or vision impaired that, that work in radio in Australia. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty good career if you're that way inclined. And I suppose that's why I make YouTube videos now, is because it's just an extension of, of what I've always done it's just a bit of a hobby but i think if i can educate somebody in the street talking one-on-one -on -one about my guide dog york and you know how not to pat him or don't try to introduce your dog to him when we're about to cross the road or something like that you know don't distract him in any way if i can do that in a youtube video and it gets viewed by a couple of thousand people well that just makes a much bigger impact and yeah. and that's what I'm doing is just doing what I would normally do, living my life, but maximising the impact mm. by sharing it with other people, that's all. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd just like to say thanks to Steve for, for coming and joining us. Um, keep on spreading the, the good work and keep spreading the news and everything like that. Um, keep up with the videos. Um, next time you go surfing, catch away for me. <laughs> <laughs> no. thanks very much, for, Thank you very thanks much. Very much for inviting me it was great talking to you all and i'd love one day to get over to the uk and if i do i'll i'll look up galloway's for sure. yeah definitely yeah You'd be more, more than welcome to come and join us on on whatever it is we're doing so so for now i'd like to say again thanks to steve and thanks very much if, if any of you are on YouTube, use YouTube, I'll definitely go and look at 
Steve's website, Steve's YouTube channel. There are plenty of really good videos on there. Um, give it a look, subscribe, help him with his numbers and everything. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon, Steve. Okay. Thank Lovely. you, Steve. All right. Thank you very Thanks much, Steve. Steve. Uh, Thanks, nice Steve. to meet you all.